Bible, if you would, would you grab a Bible and turn with me? We're going to continue on in our series in the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. And so we're reaching um, an end of a section in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Chapters 1 through 3 is almost like a big long introduction of thanksgiving and prayer and Paul's going to end this big long introduction with prayer. He's going to punctuate it with prayer. And in the weeks to come, Paul is going to give practical instructions for the church, things that they need to hear and press into. And so this morning we're looking at Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians. And so let's hear God's word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, starting in verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Father, we do ask now that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word, that you would use it for our good and that you would change us in this moment. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We've got three short verses in front of us and I want to begin this morning by using our imaginations for a bit. So let's use our imaginations. Imagine it's Sunday morning. And you have gathered with all of God's people in the city of Thessalonica. And you've gathered with God's people to worship the Lord. And you're going to do this by singing and by praying and by hearing and receiving the word of God. But this Sunday is a bit different because you feel a buzz. There's a buzz in the air. There's an excitement among God's people. And as you, as you find out about this excitement, it's due to the fact that a letter has come from the Apostle Paul, and that letter is going to be read in your gathering. And so the letter is read in your gathering. You you take it in, and and the service is over. You've heard Paul's words. And now I ask, well, what are you thinking after that? You've heard the letter of 1 Thessalonians. What are you going to say to your neighbor after the service? What are you thinking about? Well, to begin with, you're probably thinking about Paul. It is evident from this letter that Paul hasn't forgotten about you. He prays for you and he prays for you every day. He remembers you and all that has been done by you, your work of faith and labor of love and and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's also evident after listening to this letter that, that Paul is concerned about you. Even from afar, he is in these distant cities He's concerned about your welfare, and in fact, he is working for your welfare. And all of this means something as you take in this letter, and it strikes you. Paul loves me. He loves this church. There's no doubt about it. The apostle's heart is for me and turned towards me. Chapter 2, verse 8, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you were very dear to us. But you keep thinking. And as you keep thinking, your thoughts go further. They advance. And it's not just that Paul hasn't forgotten about you. It's not just that Paul is concerned about you. It's not just that Paul loves you and cares about you. You see something deeper in the midst of Paul's letter. You see that God himself hasn't forgotten about you. You see that God himself is concerned with you and everything in your life. In fact, you see this glorious reality that God loves you. And that strikes you. And as Paul sets before you the truths of the gospel again, reminding you about all that he has done for you in Christ, your heart is refreshed and confirmed in this fact that that God himself has turned his heart towards you. But you're still thinking. And in articulating all of that, thinking about Paul, you're thinking about God, that still doesn't capture all that you felt. You're not satisfied with that. And while those words are true, they don't match the experience of listening to Paul's letter. You sense it and you sense it very cleanly that that something happened to you while you were hearing Paul's words. 
It was like this. You were ushered into the very presence of God. Though your feet were still planted on the earth, somehow, in some way, it was like you were lifted up into heavenly places to be with the Lord himself. When Paul gave thanks, when Paul prayed, when Paul spoke, it was like everyone melted away. Paul melted away. The people around you melted away and you were dealing with God himself. That's what you felt when you listened to Paul's letter. Now this little exercise of imagination is helpful and I think it's helpful because it helps us understand both Paul and this letter, the first Thessalonians. Paul carried out his ministry in the presence of God. And not only that, Paul's goal in ministry was to bring God's people into the presence of God. And this is where we find ourselves in chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. What is Paul doing? He is ministering in the presence of God. And through his prayers, he is taking God's people with him into the presence of God. And so as we look at these three short verses, we see that Paul's prayer is short. Paul doesn't drone on and on. He doesn't wander and meander like he's lost and he can't find what he's looking for in his prayer. Rather, he sets before the Father and the Son two pointed petitions. In verse 11, he asks that all the obstacles keeping him from the Thessalonians would be removed. Then in verse 12, he asked that the Lord Jesus himself would intervene in the lives of the Thessalonians and the Lord would make their hearts increase and superabound in love for God's people. Then after that, in verse 13, Paul caps off his letter by giving the rationale, the reason for why he is praying. So Paul's prayer is short. We've got three verses, we've got two petitions, one explanation, and while it's short, while it's easy to, to at first glance, wrap our arms around it, it is not a simple prayer. This prayer has depth. It is profound. In fact, when we look at this prayer, we find the very essence of Christian ministry and service. Too often we see prayer as something perfunctory. We're tempted to treat prayer like the warm-up before the workout. We just need to say a quick prayer so we can get on with what we need to to do, whatever that might need, whatever that might be. Too often we see prayer as as something extra. We're tempted to treat prayer like a a garnish on the plate. It's good that prayer is there. In fact, if, if prayer was missing, we would say something is not right here. But at the same time, prayer often isn't the meat and potatoes of what we are doing in ministry. But when we treat prayer as something perfunctory or something extra, we reveal something about ourselves. We we reveal that we have lost sight of what Christian ministry and service is all about. Hear this. Christian ministry and service is not ultimately about getting a bunch of things done, nor is it ultimately about our labor, our sweat, our hard work. The essence of Christian ministry and service is this. It is communion with God. It is communion with God. We are to serve in communion with God, and the goal of all of our service in communion with God is so that others might have communion with God as well. So our task this morning is to work through this short prayer and and see that, to see it. And I'm going to start in verse 13. So I'm going to start at the end of the prayer and I'm going to work backwards. I'm going to work up from there, going into verse 12 and then verse 11. And if you're logical, I'm going to start by working through the rationale of Paul's prayer, why he's praying. And then in light of that rationale, that reasoning, we're going to consider the two petitions in verses 11 and 12. I have two aims for us this morning. My first aim for us is this, that as we study these three short verses, we might receive Paul's ministry. That is to say, through the ministry of the word, as we're hearing it and reading it, trying to understand it and and apply it to our lives, through all of this, we ourselves might be drawn up into the presence of God with Paul. We want to receive Paul's ministry. We want to go where Paul goes. We want to go to God this morning. Second aim is this, that we might be reformed by Paul's ministry. So we want to go with Paul, and as we go with Paul, we want to be changed so that we might be like Paul, that we might minister like him, that we might think like him and feel like him and desire like him. 
And so that we might ultimately find ourselves in Paul's shoes, laboring in communion with God so that others might have communion with God as well. So two aims. We want to receive Paul's ministry. We want to be reformed by Paul's ministry. So let's get to work in the text. We're going to start in verse 13. It is easy and it is quite common to lack vision for prayer. And it often goes something like this in our lives. There are several needs that you are made aware of and you need to pray about these things. Some of these needs are are temporal. Someone lost a job. Someone else is sick. Some needs are, are spiritual. Someone is really discouraged. Someone else is in need of salvation. And so what you do is you, you take all of these prayer requests, you wrap your arms around them, you bring them close, you put them into a list, and after you put them into a list, you bring them to God and you just pray through that list. You bring all of the needs to the Lord. You pray first for the job and then for the, the sickness, and then you pray for that guy who's discouraged. And then you pray for salvation, and then when you're done with all of that, you say amen, and you're on your way. We need to think about this. Certainly, there's nothing wrong with a list of petitions. Paul himself has a list of petitions. Look at our text, verse 11, verse 12. And certainly, there's nothing wrong with bringing your petitions, this list, to the Lord. Paul does that here before us. But here's the thing. Paul doesn't stop there. He goes further. He sets his petitions before the Lord for a reason. He prays because he is driven along by something. And Paul states his vision for us in verse 13. He says this, So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. What is Paul doing? He is praying with his eyes fixed fixed upon something. And what what are his eyes fixed upon? It's the day of the Lord. He tells us in very plain language that Jesus is coming for his people. The divine warrior will split open the skies and along with him a vast army of heavenly angels will bring heaven to earth in a sudden and swift manner and the result of this coming will be the fullness of God's kingdom on earth. On that day, God's manifest presence will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea and the Father himself will be so near, so present that humanity, in particular the church, will stand before the Father. Paul is praying, and he is praying as he looks at something. He's looking at the coming of Jesus. And that's quite a vision to have in prayer. It shakes us up. It gives us goosebumps, or at least it should shake us up and give us goosebumps. But here's the question. Why would Paul pray this? And what does this have to do with anything with the Thessalonian church? The coming of Jesus but we're dealing with the Thessalonians. Well, for Paul, the second coming of Jesus had everything to do with these people. And it's because of this. Paul knew that on that day, those believers will stand before God. And so Paul prays towards this end that these Christians would be made ready and prepared to stand before God at the coming of Jesus. That's Paul's desire. He wants God's people ready and prepared for the day of the Lord. But this raises another question for us, doesn't it? What does it mean to be ready and prepared for the day of the Lord? So Paul tells us what it means to be made ready and prepared. He says, their hearts must be established blameless in holiness. To make this more clear, only those who are blameless in holiness will be able to stand before the Father and enjoy communion with him forever. And this sets an enormous amount of weight upon these words established, blameless, in holiness. And so we need to chew on these words. What does Paul have in mind? First of all, Paul desires that these Thessalonians would be established. And this is a word we have heard before in the letter of 1 Thessalonians. When when Paul heard of the church's trials and troubles because of persecution, he worried about their stability, that they might fall away from Jesus. So in chapter 3, verse 2, Paul sent Timothy off to them that he might establish and exhort the Thessalonians in their faith. So Paul desires that in the midst of their suffering, their their faith would be established. And here, as he considers the day of the Lord, he desires that their hearts would be fixed and made firm for that day. And Paul goes on, they must be established in what? Blameless in holiness. And this phrase has something to do with morality. Morality. 
The things you you do with your life, the things you don't do with your life, those who are blameless in holiness are not guilty of sin. As you look at their lives, they are free from it, blameless. And Paul is telling us only those who are blameless in holiness will be able to stand before God. Only those who have been separated from the life of sin will get communion with God forever. And this makes us scratch our heads a bit. Well, who can stand before the Lord blameless in holiness? If God requires this, how could any of us ever stand before him? And we need to press in here. What does Paul mean by this phrase? Well, I don't think Paul means perfection or flawlessness. And we can know this because Paul has already used these words in this letter, and he has used these words to describe himself. So go with me to chapter 2, verse 10. He says this about his own ministry with the Thessalonians. He says, You are witnesses in God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. So get this, Paul, someone with a nature like ours, someone imperfect and flawed, in his life, during his ministry, could say, I am blameless, holy, and righteous. That's how I lived my life. That's the morality, the ethics of my life. So what does that practically mean? What does Paul want for these people? Well, it means something like this, very practically. It means that when you sin, you, you deal with your sin. It means when you sin, you bring your sin to the Lord and confess it, and then you turn from your sin, you repent of it, and it means then after that you devote yourself to the will and law of God desiring to live according to it. I think that's what Paul has in mind. That's what he wants for these people. We find another description of this in 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. This is a good description of what it means to be actually blameless in this life. John says this, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a blameless life. Walking in the light, confessing your sin, not being a hypocrite, finding righteousness and cleansing from the blood of Jesus. Dedicating your way to the way of truth. And as Paul prays for these people, this is what these people need to be prepared to stand before the Father. They need to be blameless in holiness. Now think about verse 13. Isn't this a great help for us? We often flounder in prayer. Why? Because our hearts are stuck and stagnant because we lack a vision of what we're praying for. Why are we praying now? Why are we praying for that guy who lost his job and that that woman who is sick? Why are we praying for that guy who is so discouraged and and that woman who needs salvation? Well, Paul comes to us in verse 13 and he he gives us a jolt. We, We pray because Jesus is coming back with an army of angels. We pray because all humanity will stand before the the Father and only those who are prepared and ready will be able to commune with him. Only those who are blameless in holiness will have the Father forever. We pray because we want these dear people to have communion with God now, and not just now, but forever eternal. And so that's verse 13. Paul gives us his vision for why he is praying for the church, and we need this as we pray in our own lives and for God's people. So we need to move up now. We can move from Paul's uh, rationale to the petitions. So in light of verse 13, we can ask a question. What then should we pray for if we have Paul's vision? Paul gives us an answer, verse 12. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. The connection between verse 12 and verse 13 is tight. The petition, verse 12, is the means of preparation for the last day. How are people made ready to stand before the Father? How are their hearts made blameless in holiness? They are made ready by love, and not just any sort of love, a love that is growing and increasing, and not just increasing, but overflowing beyond our boundaries for God's people, and in fact, all people. That's what God's people need. They need Love in their hearts. And from this petition, I want to set out a warning and an encouragement for us. First, the warning. 
Put on your thinking caps for a minute. If love, if love prepares you to meet God, if love prepares you to be established blameless in holiness, what then will sabotage this preparation? What will keep you from being established blameless in holiness? Well, here's the answer. Anything that is opposed to love. Anything that is against the grain of love will sabotage your preparation to meet the Father. And the Bible gives us all sorts of words for this. For example, the word bitterness. So that sour spirit that holds on to slights and wrongs, letting them ruminate in the soul. Bitterness will keep you from having eternal communion with God. Or anger. That violent eruption that comes from the soul and it comes out of the soul and in violence it just levels everyone and everything in front of you. Anger will keep you from having eternal communion with God or unforgiving spirit, that refusal to release someone from their sins. They want to be released, but you won't let go of it. An unforgiving spirit will keep you from having eternal communion with God. And Paul takes this seriously. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, Paul confirms this sort of reasoning. He says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk from your mouth. Paul is reasoning with us. He's saying, dear Christians, put all of these things away. Put them away because you've been united to Jesus, his death and resurrection. But even more, these realities, all of them, the wrath of God is coming for them. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. So anything that stands opposed to love separates us from communion with God. And the great danger in this is that sin beguiles us and deceives us. Just think about some of those sins we worked through just a minute ago. The sin of bitterness. What does bitterness do? Well, it comes to your soul and it starts preaching a sermon. Bitterness says, you have a good reason to feel this way, don't you? No one understands all the wrong that has happened to you. You can keep brooding. You can keep ruminating. It is right and good to do this. You can feel this way. The sin of anger is not subtle at all. It comes to the soul and it just shouts at the soul, you're right, you're right, you're right. They're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong. You can do this. You can do it. What does an unforgiving spirit say? They have no right to be released from their sin. They did you such wrong. You can hold on to it. You can punish them by not forgiving them. But what does Paul do? What does this line of reasoning do for us? It gives us ammunition against our sin. It shows us exactly what these sins will do if we let them set down roots in our souls and have a permanent lives in our souls. They will keep us from the most blessed God in communion with him forever. And so we can go to war with our sin. When anger comes, we can say, anger, it's not worth it. I want to have communion with God. Or or bitterness, I will drive you out because I want communion with God. Anything that separates me from love and pursuing it i got to get rid of it because I want communion with God above all. So there's a warning here for us, but more importantly, there's encouragement here for us. And so Paul is well aware of what is in the human heart. He's well aware of the human heart because he had a human heart. He knew about all of these sins. He knew about anger and bitterness and an unforgiving spirit. But Paul's hope here in this prayer isn't the human heart. His hope is the Lord Jesus. So he prays, he says, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. And Paul's prayer is a jolt of encouragement. Brother, sister, and Jesus, what is your confidence for the last day? It is this, the Lord Jesus himself. You will stand holy and blameless before the Father because Jesus is working for you. And what is Jesus going to do for you? He and his sovereign power is going to grab hold of your heart and he is going to make it increase and superabound in love for God's people and in fact for all people. This is so encouraging. And this petition It's full of encouragement. It's limitless with encouragement. Just think about all the entailments of this encouragement. Think about the power of Jesus. We are so easily overcome by sin. We are so easily overcome by sin. 
But what does Paul do? He calls on the Lord Jesus. Here is Jesus, the one who cast out demons, the one who subdued storms, the one who forgave sins, the one who conquered death, the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. And this Jesus, this Jesus will subdue your stubborn heart from sin. Another entailment, the mercy and kindness of Jesus. We we weary ourselves with our sin. In a struggle and fight against sin, we grow so discouraged as we see the little progress in our lives. We should look at ourselves and we despair. But what does Paul do? He calls upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who does not grow weary of sinners, the one who is called a sympathetic high priest, the one who is stationed at the right hand of the Father to intercede for sinners, bearing them up before the Father again and again and again. Or think about the wisdom of Jesus. Our hearts often befuddle us. As we try to understand them and what's going on in them, it seems that we've entered into this labyrinth and the deeper we go, the less sense there is of what's going on inside of us. But Paul calls on Jesus. And that's such good news because Jesus is the one who fashioned our hearts. He made us. And he has wisdom because he knows our hearts better than we know our hearts. And this Jesus will come and he will take control of our hearts as we pray to him. Or consider the resources of Jesus. We quickly run out of gas. Our capacity for love is so small and minuscule. We love for a day and then we grow tired and weary in it. We love for a moment and we think, how can I keep doing this? But Paul calls on Jesus, and Jesus has at his disposal all the riches and treasures of grace in heaven, and Jesus has rights and authority to bring all of those riches and treasures of graces to bear upon his people, for he suffered, and he died, and he has the Spirit, and he gives the Spirit to the church. Now, as we take all of this in, isn't verse 12 such a great help to us? How does it help us? Paul is training us. Dear church, won't you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Isn't that such an encouragement? We can call upon Jesus. We can call upon a Savior who is powerful and merciful and kind and altogether wise. And we can trust, just as Paul did, that this Jesus who is in the heavens will work for us even right now. We are not hopeless. We are not stuck, for we have Jesus. And as we pray to him, he works for our good. And doesn't this urge you towards prayer? Doesn't this turn your heart to the Lord Jesus to seek him and all his help? That's what it did for Paul. And and if we take Paul's words in faith, that's what they'll do for us. And so there's verse 12. We can finally move. We looked at verse 13, verse 12, now up to verse 11. Paul prays. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Of all that we've worked through, verse 11 is the easiest petition to understand. What is Paul praying? He wants to be with the Thessalonians. He wants to, as we saw in chapter 3, verse 10, supply what is lacking in their faith. So in verse 11, he casts this whole matter of his travel, of his plans, of his journeys before the Father and the Son, and he asks that all of these obstacles that are standing in his way, Satan is standing in his way, angry crowds are standing in his way, authorities are standing in his way, and he prays that God and the Son would remove these obstacles and through all of these obstacles make a path for him to be with the Thessalonians. And why would Paul pray like this? Well, first of all, Paul prayed like this because he knew that these enemies could only be overcome by God. Paul knew that he didn't have the power to make this happen, and so he he cast this matter before the Father, make a way for me through all of these enemies. And Paul knew he didn't have the wisdom or the genius to outwit or maneuver all of these enemies. And so he cast this matter before the Father and the Son. Make a way for me so that I might be with the Thessalonians. But underneath this, I think we see something even greater. We see Paul's heart. We see his desires. Paul prays this prayer. Make a way for me through all of these enemies because why he wants to be personally engaged in the fight of faith for the Thessalonians. 
Paul is not content to be separated from his spiritual children. He's not content to just write letters and send them off to them or, or send messengers like Timothy to them. He wants to be with these Christians and see them face to face. He wants to work as Christ's servant and strengthen and encourage and help these people. He wants to do all that he can as Jesus' emissary to prepare these people to meet the Father when Jesus comes. That's what Paul wants. That's why he's so eager. That's why he prays, clear a way that I might find these people and be with them. Now again, isn't verse 11 a great help for us? It's so practical. Christian, you can entrust the entirety of your ministry to God. You can entrust the entirety of your ministry to God. And see, we, he, we see Paul doing this. He had travel problems. He had travel problems. He couldn't get to Thessalonica. And what does he do? He casts the whole matter before God and the Son. And so we can do that. We can cast the small matters that, that stymie us in our ministry like travel plans. We can cast the, the big matters of our ministry. We can cast all the matters of our ministries before the Son and the Father. And we can trust that our God will come to our aid and help us. Even more, we learn something here. What is Paul doing? He is expressing the desires of his heart to the Father and the Son. He is taking what he feels about these people and he is bringing it to the Lord. He wants to help these people in their faith. And so what is he doing? Very directly, he's taking all the desires of his heart and he's bringing them to the Father and the Son. And what is Paul training us to do? Taking our desires for ministry and bringing them to the Lord and setting them before them, seeing that he might do something with them. So there we have the entirety of Paul's prayer. We started in verse 13, and in verse 13 we're exposed to Paul's vision for prayer. Before him he sets the day of the Lord. Jesus is coming back, and on that day God's kingdom will arrive, and people will stand before the Father. And Paul desires what? We saw his heart. He wants God's people to be ready for that day, established blameless in holiness. So he prays towards that, and he labors towards that end. And so in verse 12, he prays that Jesus would intervene for these people and that he would make their hearts increase in superabound in love. And we need that prayer. And then he prays in verse 11 very practically that the Father and the Son would clear a path for him so that he might be united with God's people. So where does this leave us this morning? Well, I hope and I pray that in these three verses that God was so kind as to commune with you, that you were able to travel with Paul up into the presence of God and, and enjoy him. I hope that God has changed the desires of your heart and that you, you long to have communion with the Father and the Son as Paul did. And I hope that God has been so kind to, to begin to reform your hearts and your minds, that you might minister like Paul. And where really does this leave us? It's really asking a question of us, isn't it? Will you now go commune with God? Will you really seek the Father and the Son, bringing your heart to Him, enjoying His presence and praying and longing that others would too? And so with that, let's pray. Oh, Father, we are so thankful that we can meet with you this morning. We're so thankful for these three short verses, this prayer of Paul. There's nothing like meeting with you, Father, and we have met with you. And Father, it is our heart's desire that more would meet with you. And not only that, we desire that we would be able to meet with you forever. And so would you establish our hearts? And would you do it through the work of your Son, increasing our love and making it superabound. We need this. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.